Okay, this is a lecture for my second hour class on the 13th of April. You will have a test tomorrow. You need to go back to the election of 1956 through wh what we covered today. Anyway, Kennedy was opposed. He said, you know, Martin, you know this march is calling uh, attention to the fact that uh, there is a lot of inequality in America. Uh, so but now today, the Kennedy partisans, the, the Camelot School, they called them. We talked about Camelot, didn't we? The Camelot School, they called them. Today, Kennedy partisans say that Kennedy was this great uh, liberal and advocate of change, and John F. Kennedy wasn't. He was a tough cold warrior, and I'm going to show you that. He was a tough, hawkish cold warrior. Uh, his idea, what you know, Truman said, well, let's have containment. Well, Kennedy certainly was in favor of containment, but he said, we're going to take the war to uh, the Soviet Union. So he gave this uh, speech. Uh, it's been described as Lincoln-esque, and I think, it, I think it is. I think there are two great inaugural addresses. I think one is Lincoln's second inaugural address. His first inaugural address is a legal document. His second inaugural address, and Kennedy's only inaugural address, okay? And so, uh, like Teddy Roosevelt, he said we needed, America needed a challenge in the 1960s. He said, because if we don't have a challenge, this could have been Teddy Roosevelt talking in uh, 1904. Because if we don't have a great challenge, he said, we will go the way of all great powers. Uh, usually powers claw their way to the top and they create a magnificent society and they have luxury and wealth and power. And then they just sit down and rest. And while they're resting, they grow soft and squishy. And the next thing you know, a stronger power is taking their place. And he said, that's what's gonna happen to the United States if we don't have a challenge. He threw down the gauntlet. He said, and I quote, and now the trumpet summons us again. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. By the way, there's Kennedy, the first president born in the 20th century and sitting right there where that plug-in is from him is Dwight Eisenhower, the last president born in the 19th century. At that time, Dwight Eisenhower was the oldest man to have served. I mean, and you could stand there and you could see the contrast between the 42-year-old, 43-year-old John Kennedy and Dwight Eisenhower, who was approaching 70. And approaching 70 in those days was ancient for a president. Of course, unlike today, where approaching 100, you're just hitting your second stride. And I'm talking about both sides, Democrats and Republicans today. That's just my opinion. But Kennedy said that the, you know, the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, born in this century, tempered by war. That's World War II. This is the gener his generation that don't do World War II. Disciplined by a hard and bitter peace. That's the Cold War that followed World War II. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe in order to assure the survival and the success of freedom. That's taking the war to the enemy. That's no longer contained. contained. That's taking the war to it. And I quote, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility I welcome it. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country, end quote. And then he ended with these magnificent words. <clears throat> with a good conscience, and I quote, with a good conscience as our only true reward, with history, the final judge of our deeds. Isn't that magnificent? With history, the final judge of our deeds. Let us go forward to lead the land we love, asking his blessing, his blessing, and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own, end quote. And so with that, he began his presidency. Uh, he almost immediately, get this down, uh, entered into a huge arms race. You know, he is the man who... That you know, the Democrats in 1960 had made up the fiction that we were behind the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a missile gap 
it was completely untrue, but now that he's elected, he's got the, you know, Mr. Kennedy, we elected you because there's a missile gap, and you get, now he's got to start building up on He also, get this now, is going to increase America's commitment to Vietnam. If you listen to the Camelot, to the Kennedy partisans today, they will leave you with a distinct impression. You know, it's just, it's just almost common for people to say, well, if John Kennedy had lived, we'd have never been in Vietnam. Well, that may be true. John Kennedy did live, so nobody can say that. That may be true. He might have avoided Vietnam, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, uh, he immediately increased the number of American advisors to Vietnam. Uh, when he took over as president, I think there was something like 5,000 American advisors in Vietnam, Amer just advisors, not combat troops. By the way, which president's going to send the first combat troops to Vietnam? Lyndon Johnson, the man that succeeds Kennedy. But there, I think, were 5,000 advisors in Vietnam that had been there during the Eisenhower years. They'd been there, you know, going all the way back to Truman. Uh, Truman is the first Vietnam, quote, Vietnam president. When Kennedy, on the day John F. Kennedy was killed in Dallas, Texas, November 22, 1963, assassinated, there were 16,000, 16,000 advisors in Vietnam. I don't know how you cut the cards, but that doesn't seem like he was decreasing America's uh, commitment commitment uh, to Vietnam. Uh, of course, Kennedy, Kennedy, get this down, was uh, a, uh, a new frontiersman. That, the new, you know, we've talked about the new frontier, haven't we? Yes, that was, you know, Roosevelt had the New Deal, Truman had the Fair Deal, Teddy Roosevelt had the Square Deal, John Kennedy had the New Frontier, you know, King on Teddy Roosevelt. This is America's new challenge, the New Frontier. The New Frontier. Um, and, um, you know, he's going to appoint some liberals, get this down, he's, because he'd had the support of the liberals, the college professors, the college students, the, the, the liberals. Uh, have supported, you know, I mean, the same people who elected Barack Obama, quite frankly, okay, um, have supported John Kennedy. And so John Kennedy has to make, uh, give the appearance that he's running a semi-liberal administration. So get this down, he's going to appoint some uh, liberals, and you don't have to write this man down, uh, such as Arthur Schlesinger, who was a history professor. He's no longer with us. His father was a history professor. Of course, he's no longer with us. Uh, but Schlesinger's one of the great American historians. He comes out of the New Deal tradition, Franklin Roosevelt New Deal tradition, and uh, he's one of the people that you will see praising John Kennedy. I don't think he gives him a free pass, but he, he appointed Schlesinger just to, and, and, and Schlesinger didn't have any particular job in the White House, really. He had a title, but he was just there. So he could point, you know, so the liberals could say, yeah, you know, Kennedy's putting liberals in, you understand that, liberals in his, but the real important jobs, get this down, went to hard-nosed hawks, okay, doves and hawks, okay, men like, get this down, men like uh, Dean Rusk, uh, who was from Cherokee, Georgia, Dean Rusk was Secretary of State, and he's pretty hawkish. In other words, you know, duh, a, duh, a dove will say, well, let's settle this peacefully, let's negotiate. A hawk will go nose to nose with you if need be, use force. Okay, a hawk. And then this man, I don't know if I've got a picture of him. Uh, not that man. Uh, well, I don't have a picture of him, but I will later. A man named Robert McNamara. Write him down, Robert McNamara. And I'm going to tell you, McNamara, uh, he was the Secretary of Defense for both Kennedy and Johnson, for both Kennedy and Johnson. And again, uh, great events can rarely, if ever, be ascribed to one person. But I want to tell you what, Robert McNamara comes close. If I had to pick, if we were just playing some sort of game, if I had to pick the one person that I think was most uh, responsible for the American tragedy in Vietnam, and again, there's not just one person, but if I had to, you know, see what I'm saying? It would be Robert McNamara. He bears, you know, get that down. He bears, he bears, I think, the, 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 the majority of the blame for the tragedy 
that the United States um, suffered in Vietnam. Suffered in Vietnam. And so Kennedy's going to increase or enter into an arms race. He's going to increase funding for special forces. You know, Teddy Roosevelt had the Marines. Kennedy has the Green Beret. I think that's what I've got this young man up here for. There's a Green Beret, okay? I think we still have a Green Beret. It's special forces. Kennedy created that. And by the way, their specialty is jungle warfare. What was he thinking about? Vietnam, Vietnam in the back of his mind. Vietnam. And so it was clear from the very beginning that Kennedy was going to take the fight to the communists. Well, one of the first things that Kennedy learned, uh, even before he was sworn in as president, you know, the elected president well, if there's this, will go visit with the sitting president before he's sworn in, and the sitting president will sort of bring you up to date on how things are. I don't think that happened with Trump and Biden, but that shows how bitter we've become in our politics. By the way, Eisenhower didn't like Kennedy, and I, I could tell you what he called him. He called him that little blank. I won't say it, especially since I'm on tape here today. But that little blank. He, he couldn't stand Kennedy. He just was horrified that Kennedy. You know, but, you know, these people used to put the country first instead of their own personal political ambitions, okay? Or feelings. You know, we don't get into feelings, though. You know, I feel. Who cares about what you feel? Well, I think, who cares about what you think? I watch Judge Judy. I like her. The people say, well, Judge, I feel. And she reminds them, your feelings aren't going to decide this, Jack. What decides the proceedings in a court of law? The law. Yeah, yeah. So I want you, when you graduate from high school, to take a big, thick notebook with you. And, and every time you meet somebody that cares about your feelings, write them down. You won't use many pages anyway. Horrible, isn't it? Uh, anyway, we live in that age of feelings. <clears throat> well, anyhow, Kennedy and Eisenhower met. This was before the age of feelings. People put their feelings behind them for the good of the country. And they talked. They talked about the world situation. And Eisenhower informed Kennedy, you get this down, that he had authorized, as Ike did this, he had authorized the CIA to invade Cuba and overthrow who? Castro. Castro. Very good. Castro. And, uh, you know, the CIA had come up with a plan that uh, would not involve, well, so far as the world would know, would not involve the United States. Because, you know, when Castro took over, thousands and thousands of Cubans fled Cuba and came to the United States. And so the CIA, this is operation, the CIA had taken these thousands of Cubans, most of them here in Florida, in the southern part of the United States, and had taken 1,400 of them here to Honduras, out in the jungles of Honduras, and this was all top, 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 top secret, and they had trained them uh, in warfare. And now the plan uh, was this, that uh, the United States was going to provide an unmarked ship. There would be no flags, no names. It was actually an old tanker called the Rio Escondido. But anyway, they were going to provide a ship. And the United States would take these uh, 1,400 Cubans who hated Castro, armed them, trained them, put them on this ship, and would take them right up here. You see, you can see... Here's Havana, which is the capital city. They would land them right here in that bay that you see there, and that was called the Bay of Pigs, okay? The Bay of Pigs. And so this is the Bay of Pigs operation, okay? And, of course, the United States would send U.S. combat planes, jets, but they would be unmarked. There would be no insignia on it, so nobody could prove anything. And uh, the United States would bombed the Cuban airfield so that the Cubans couldn't put their planes up once the invasion started. And by the way, the promise was, and if anything goes wrong here, if anything goes wrong here, uh, we will evacuate you. We will you know, put, rescue you, put you on a ship, and bring you back to the United States. And that was the promise. And of course, the CIA had assured President Eisenhower 
and I will assure President Kennedy once he's president, and they had assured him that the Cuban people hated Castro. That was here's the reason this is going to fail, and it almost derails Kennedy's presidency before the presidency gets started. Kennedy sworn in in January. This takes place in April. It almost you know destroys his administration before it's even started. But here's what the CIA had told both the both Eisenhower and Kennedy that the Cuban people hated Castro. They did not. The Cuban people loved Castro. He's going to be the dictator of Cuba until 2016. He just recently died. Uh, uh, the Cuban people, why did they love Castro? Because the United States and its allies, since the Spanish-American War in 1898, for 60 years, the United States, uh, you know, had, uh, had uh, dominated Cuba. And not just the United States, but the United States mainly. Uh, Batista... This guy that Castro overthrew was hated, genuinely hated by the Cuban people. But how did he stay in power? With the support of the United States. We were providing him an army and all the a police force and all the things he needed to continue his tyrannical rule uh, in Cuba. So the CIA got it exactly backwards, okay? But they told them as soon as the first shots fired, as soon as the first uh, uh, Cuban steps out here in the Bay of Pigs, uh, the Cuban people will rise up and they will overthrow Castro. Uh, and, of course, that was absolutely true. But what they said, this will be a piece of cake. This will be a piece of cake. And the, and the beauty of it all will be, so far as the world will know, the Cuban people overthrew. Get some of this down. The Cuban people had overthrown Castro, not the United States. The United States will come out of this and nobody will know that we were involved. You know, the more you talk about this, the more ridiculous it looks today. But anyway, piece of cake. Um, and, uh, of course, um, you know, uh, Kennedy uh, signs, signs on. And, you know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, those, are, those are the leading military men, come in and say, it'll work, Mr. President. Don't worry. It'll be easy. This will be a great victory uh, for us in the Cold War. Uh, another problem is here, too, that these Cubans were not professional soldiers. And I know in the movies, any old nabob can get a gun and run out and defeat the whole I don't know, the Russian army. Well, that's not true. You know, people who have training in warfare, people who have good officers with experience, they usually win. Uh, these were priests and bankers and teachers and ranchers and businessmen. And again, they had been promised by the United States that if anything went wrong, the United States would evacuate. So on April 17, 1961, Kennedy's only been president for a few weeks. I guess in his mind, he thought, I'm going to start off my presidency with a great victory, with a big bang here. Well, it was a big bang, all right. April 17, they landed. By the way, Castro was real waiting for him. He was on full alert. Guess what we did today? Guess what we did on the afternoon of April the 16th? We sent unmarked jets flying over Cuba and bombed their airfields. Uh, that put the whole Cuban army on. You know, they know something's up. The whole Cuban army is on high alert. And when these guys step off in the Bay of Pigs, these 1,400 people, they're just trapped. And they're going to be shot to pieces. And they're on radios. Their leaders are on radios calling for the... And they look out there and see the ship that brought them. It's an American ship. And all of a sudden, the ship lifts anchor and it just goes away and leaves them stranded there. Okay. Uh, Kennedy's sitting up in his bedroom in the White House crying. And this whole thing has just gone, has just gone to pieces. Just gone to pieces. Those people that were not killed are going to be arrested. There's going to be a great show trial held in a big soccer stadium for the whole world to see. Talk about the psychology of the Cold War. Here in the massive United States, had invaded us. And this is what the Russians are going to do with this. Here, the massive United States had invaded the tiny third world country of Cuba. Without provocation, Cuba had done nothing to the United States. The Russian, Khrushchev said, they talk about us being aggressors in Berlin. Well, who's the aggressor here? Who's the aggressor here? Uh, you know, who's the, they say, we're the threat to world peace. Well, we're not, you know, who's the, who's the threat to world peace? Soviet communism or U.S. democracy? What is it? The United States is nothing but a bully. But you know what? Even though Cuba's army was only one fiftieth as strong as the United States military, Cuba 
defeated this bunch of bully uh, capitalists. You see what the you see what the communists do with this? Of course, the Republicans at home have a field day as well. They lash out at Kennedy. They said, "See, we told you to elect Nixon, who had experience, but no, you've got to put this young kid, this inexperienced guy, up there in the White House." And look what happened. What we told you is exactly true. Well, you know, when Kennedy dried his tears, he took on a fighting stance, though. Believe it or not, you know, I mean, this, this could have been the end of his administration. But he calls a press conference at the White House. And I think he opens with the words that said this. He said, while victory is an or uh, while victory has while victory has a while victory has a hundred fathers, defeat is an orphan. End quote. History, and quote again, history will record that the bitter struggle of the Cold War reached its climax in the late 1950s and 1960s. Let me make clear as President of the United States that I am determined upon our system's survival and success regardless of the danger. End quote. He took a fighting stance, and guess what? What it could have been, he went up and approved. He actually went up and approved. The Republicans couldn't believe it. And I'll tell you, here's another result. Again, this is this is, but that's not the most important result of the Bay of Pigs. Here's the most important result. Check this out. Kennedy will never again, never again, trust the CIA and military leaders again. Everything they tell him, he will take with a certain degree of skepticism. And I'm going to tell you something. One year. From the Bay, well, a little over a year from the Bay of Pigs, and not go, go forward to October of 1962. So here's where this pays the dividend: October of 1962, the greatest crisis maybe in the history of the world. It was the, over the Soviet Union having missiles in Cuba. Now, by the way, here's another result of the uh, Bay of Pigs: as you know, Castro's down here just expecting the United States to invade at any time, and it all goes to hell in a handbasket. So just as soon as the air is clear, Castro, in 1961, approaches the Soviet Union saying, we need weapons here. Will you give us missiles? And the Soviet Union has been looking for a way. You know, here we are in Berlin. Here we are in Berlin. Uh, Khrushchev said this is a, uh, the American president, presence in Berlin. And by the way, we've got all kinds of weapons there in Berlin pointed right at Moscow. Uh, Castro said, uh, Berlin is a dagger at the throat of the Soviet Union. The Soviets have been looking for a way to, to hedge in in the Western Hemisphere, and when Castro invites them to say, in 61, after the Bay of Pigs, to give them missiles, they say, yeah, you know, yeah, we'll do it. And they start preparing to put missiles, they start preparing to put missiles in Cuba, okay? And a few months later, uh, there are these missile silos. They're ready for the missiles to arrive on board a ship and put them in those silos. It's the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we're going to talk all about it. It's the Cuban Missile Crisis. But guess what? The CIA, of course, Kennedy is meeting around the clock with his advisors. And the CIA and the military come in, and they say, Mr. President, this is the chance we've been want waiting for. We can avenge that whole Bay of Pigs thing. We need to invade Cuba. We need to invade Cuba and take out Castro. Uh, and Kennedy says, thank you very much. Uh, uh, he decides against that. And that could have led to a nuclear war that might have ended civilization as the world knows it. But Kennedy didn't trust them after the Bay of Pigs. And he decided... Instead of a military action in October of 1962, Kennedy decided to negotiate, and through negotiations, the world was spared a nuclear war. And by the way, the United States comes out of this whole thing smelling like a rose, and the um, missiles of October, as it's called, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, turns out to be Kennedy's greatest victory, and one of the greatest victories of the United States uh, in the uh, in, uh, the Cold War, okay? So, but Kennedy never, ever, ever trusted the CIA and the military again. That's going to pay him huge dividends and the world, not just him, but the world's huge dividends a year later. Well, meanwhile, 
uh, Khrushchev and the Soviets were looking at all of this, and they took uh, the failure uh, of the Bay of Pigs as a sign that Kennedy, the job was simply too big for Kennedy. And he wasn't up to being president. They even thought he looked weak. And of course, before the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy had scheduled a meeting with Khrushchev uh, that would take place here, and there's Austria right there. It would take place in Austria. It was Kennedy's new president, and it's the first time that the new president would meet with the leader of the Soviet Union. And at this meeting, get this down, at this meeting, Khrushchev thought that he could intimidate Kennedy. He said, I'm going to assert my supremacy and the supremacy of the Soviet Union over this new, immature, weak president. And he viewed Kennedy as being wounded so as far as his, and Kennedy was wounded so far as his presidency was concerned. When he meets with Khrushchev, uh, he hasn't fully, his administration hasn't fully recovered from the Bay of Pigs yet. And Khrushchev looks to score right there in the whole world, the whole world, the press of the whole world is covering this meeting. And Khrushchev looks to uh, uh, score another great psychological victory like Sputnik over the United States. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Kennedy and they, they meet and uh, they're out on the front steps of this room where they building where they meet. And Kennedy and Khrushchev shake hands and smile for the camera. Uh, and uh, they walk in and it's in a small room and it's Kennedy and Khrushchev and, and a Russian interpreter. And it's just a little couch and a table. There's not much there. And boy, just as soon as their butts hit the cushions on that couch, Khrushchev just bangs the table and he snarls at Kennedy and he says, you know, and Khrushchev's the older man, I'll teach this punk kid, that's his attitude, snarls at him that he said, get this down, U.S. troops in Berlin are a dagger at the Soviet heart. And he banged on the table and he said this, you're going you're gonna to take those troops, you're going to take those American troops out of West Berlin, right? West Berlin, you're going to take them out. And he said if Kennedy didn't, there would be war. And here you have this fat, crude, big fisted Russian who could barely sign his name. And boy, Kennedy had never <laughs> talked too long. Here's Kennedy, this Harvard educated rich boy, this elitist. I mean, it completely, you know, Kennedy goes in and we're gonna have this pleasant chat, and Khrushchev is all over. And when they come back out of this, uh, out of this meeting, when they come back out of this meeting. Uh, you can see Khrushchev is just kind of grimly determined that Kennedy's as pale as a ghost. I mean, he's been through the he's been through the ringer here. Uh, he literally had caught Kennedy off guard. Uh, and Berlin, get this down, becomes the epicenter. Okay, it becomes the epicenter of the Cold War. After this, all eyes are on Berlin. Epicenter, epicenter. It's a place. It's where, where a volcano is that can explode at any time. That's what an epicenter is. Well, Berlin could have exploded at any time. If Berlin exploded, there could be a nuclear nuclear war. I told you that the Kennedy administration, they just go from one crisis to another. I told you the Kennedy administration is the most dangerous moment of the Cold War. Well, meanwhile, you know, the world is watching this. And, of course, now the crisis moves to Berlin. And Berliners are certainly watching this. Uh, and on August 12, 1961, uh, Berliners in East Berlin, now you've got to think of the history you already know. You remember that Berlin is divided, right? East and West. East is communist, West is democracy. Also, Berlin, you know, if this is Germany, here's West Germany, here's East Germany, and here's Berlin. Berlin is surrounded by Russian troops. Uh, there's one road leading to it, 100 miles away. We talked about that. Uh, and the city of Berlin is divided into Communist Berlin and Free Berlin, East and West Berlin. And on August 12th, the people of Berlin, watching the newscast, reading the newspapers, they began to determine something bad is about to happen here. And if something bad, if war breaks out in Berlin, we darn sure don't want to be on the communist side. So they start fleeing to West Berlin. In fact, in one day, 4,000 East, Ber East Berliners went to West Berlin. Uh, and a lot of these people were professionals. 
uh, attorneys, doctors, teachers, uh, and so forth, fled, 4,000. Uh, and it continued all day. And more people were observed preparing. They were packing what they could carry, but they were preserving, or, or preparing, excuse me, uh, to, to flee in the next day or so. And the Russians look and say, you know, we've got a problem on our hands. You know, most of Berlin, East Berlin, could uh, swarm over to the West. And so on the 13th, uh, that happens on the 12th, the 4,000 person exodus. On the 13th, sirens at 2 o'clock in the morning, sirens start sounding right in the heart of Berlin. Soviet troops and East German troops start marching right there to the border of East and West Berlin. This is all taking place this is not East and West Germany. This is East and West Berlin. And Soviet tanks and troops seal off East Berlin. And in front of those tanks, workers are stringing barbed wire. And as a temporary barrier, and between, you know, look, you've got the tanks, you've got the scrolls of barbed wire, uh, this is West Berlin here, uh, but West Berliners are awakened by all of this, and they stand on the roofs of their houses and apartment buildings, and they look over, and they see that construction crews are coming, and they are starting to build, just like out of this concrete box, just like this, a wall across Berlin. Get this down. They're building a wall. And this isn't some small, small thing. It's a hundred... It'll eventually be a hundred, you know, Berlin's a huge city. Millions of people live there. It'll eventually be 103 miles long and 12 feet high. And this is the Berlin Wall. Get this down. They seal off Berlin. There it is. Okay. They seal off west from east. Families are separated. Families won't see each other for 30 years. Okay. 30 years. Uh... This is the biggest, get this down, this is the biggest mistake the Soviet Union made in the Cold War. Because this wall is a symbol of oppression. And the Soviets are saying our way of life will be better under communism. Yeah. Well, then they're pointing out all the problems that take place in democracies. Well, this is a symbol of oppression. It's literally a wall of shame. And the Berlin Wall here, it's 103 miles long. The Berlin Wall uh, becomes the most famous symbol of the Cold War. It really highlighted the fact that this struggle, when you boil it all down, this struggle was a fight between liberty and tyranny. And the whole world could see it. And Kennedy and his people jump all over that because they've been taking it on the chin from the communists. Kennedy made a statement. He said, and I quote, democracy is not perfect and we have our problems, but we've never had to build a wall to keep our people in. End quote. This is a tremendous, the Soviets hand the West a tremendous propaganda coup. And then, of course, Kennedy, and I'm going to show you this in just a moment, Kennedy Kennedy uh, visits uh, the uh, Berlin Wall uh, after it's built. There he is. And they built the platform in West Berlin. And he's just standing there overlooking the Berlin Wall and tens of hundreds of thousands, just a second, of people come out to uh, listen to Kennedy. And Kennedy says, all free men are citizens of Berlin. Therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. I am a Berliner. And the place just roared. Ronald Reagan will go back there. The Berlin Wall just became a place where American presidents went until the Cold War was over to emphasize the fact the Soviets criticize us, and they say their way of life is better, but they've got to build a wall to keep their people in. We've never had to do that. 
Ronald Reagan stood there right where Kennedy had stood. It, it was a different Soviet dictator. His name was Mikhail Gorbachev. Coach Newton, third hour class needs to report to the library. Coach Newton, third hour class report to the library. And right, Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And by the way, when the Berlin Wall came down, when East and West Berliners with sledgehammers went out in the streets and tore that wall down and East and West Berlin was united, that was the end of the Cold War. Write that down, the destruction of the Berlin Wall. That was the end of the Cold War. Very quickly here, well, so far as Vietnam was concerned, like I say, Kennedy increased the aid to Vietnam. By the way, what's the capital city of uh, Vietnam today? Hanoi. Okay, Hanoi was the capital city of what during the Vietnam War? Uh, North Vietnam. North Vietnam. What was the South? Saigon. You spell that right. Saigon, South Vietnam. There is no longer a South Vietnam. Today it's Ho Chi Minh City, okay? Um, and by the way, where in the Vietnam War, it's no longer divided there, but in the Vietnam War, where was Vietnam divided? At the se I want you to 17th parallel. That's Vietnam. Where was Korea divided? 38th parallel. Okay, you'll see those uh, kind of review questions tomorrow. But one other thing. Um, um, the, uh, who was president when the Vietnam War ended? Nixon. Write that down. I'm just going ahead of it. Nixon. And, um, of course, Lyndon Johnson is the guy that sent the most troops to Vietnam. Nixon pulled them out. <laughs> One other thing, during Kennedy's administration, the United States, well, even in Eisenhower, began to try and win, and I think we've talked about this, the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. We built roads and hospitals, schools. Why couldn't we, why didn't that program succeed? One man, Ho Chi Minh, he was the great national hero. And all the efforts, all of we did the same thing in Afghanistan. Thank you. All the efforts that we made to win them over to our side, fake, because Ho Chi Minh was viewed as a great national hero. All right. Well, tell your friends about this test tomorrow, and uh, that's what we will do.